I'm here with, with a towel and I will tell you in a moment a little bit more about that. So we're coming to the next itch hikes, which uh, are going a little bit further into the future and into the problems that we face. And who could be more perfectly suited to guide us into the strange new worlds and realities in the future than chief technology officers of companies that have been around for more than 125 years and still are young, still are doing fine, and still are innovative. For them, the term don't panic seems to be the guiding motto when dealing with uncertainties and change. 125 years, just imagine, that was the beginning of electrification. Horse carriages and coal-fired steam trains were the means of transport. Computers, internet was merely a dream. 125 years ago, there was a big technological change that was beginning. And it also marked the point in time uh, which, which marked the rising of Switzerland as one of the leading technology nations in the world. And two of the companies that helped to build that new nation are here with us tonight. It's the Bühler Group and the ABB Group, represented by their CTOs, the Chief Technology Officers. Now I come to this towel, because in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, towels play a, a very important role, because and I quote, a towel is about the most massively useful thing a hitchhiker can have. Someone who can hitch the length and breadth of the galaxy and still knows where his towel is, is clearly someone who has his stuff together and knows what he's doing. So Ian Roberts, CTO at the Bühler Group since 2010, is undoubtedly such a person. Ian graduated in chemical engineering and obtained a PhD in process engineering from the University of Wales. After that, he held, held various positions at Nestle, for example, as the director of the innovation in Mexico or as the director of the Chocolate Center of Excellence in Switzerland. Ian, the controls are yours. Let's hitch a hike to the Bühler Galaxy. Please welcome Ian. <laughs> So thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, let me take you back to the beginning of the travels and the travails of our long-suffering and often bewildered anti-hero, Arthur Dent, the star of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you remember the situation, Arthur was lying in the mud in front of a bright yellow bulldozer, trying to stop Mr. Prosser and the obdurate angry gentleman from bulldozing, demolishing his house. Mr. Prosser was a man who struggled with reality. He was haunted by dreams and visions of his enemies being speared to death around the setting of burning villages. And he had this predilection for little furry hats because unbeknown to him, he was a very direct descendant of Genghis Khan. And his choleric behavior resulted directly from this. So at this time, you have Arthur lying on the floor in the mud. You have Mr. Prosser arguing with him. And Arthur is completely fixated by his local problem, blissfully unaware that his entire world will change that day in two ways. The first thing that changes his world is his best friend, Ford Prefect, terribly named, turns out not to be from Guildford, but a small planet in the vicinity of Betelgeuse. And the news his best friend brings is, they're going to destroy the Earth to make a new hyperspace bypass. So his world is going to end. And this gentleman is responsible because this is Prostetnik, Prostetnik Vogelnjeltz. He's the commander of the Vogon ship, this huge ship that hangs above the earth exactly in the way that bricks don't. And he's charged with the mission to destroy the earth. Now, the Vogons are so hideously repulsive, 
that not even their mothers love them. Their greatest threat is to read you their poetry, but they have to tie you down so that you survive it. Not that they care if you survive, because their disregard for beauty and for nature is famous. In Volksfeer, their planets, they have these scintillating, bejeweled crabs, and their pastime is to smash them and destroy them with hammers. The beautiful young trees they cut down for the fuel to cook the crabs, and the elegant gazelles that are abundant in this world, they catch and they sit upon, not for transport, because they love to hear their spines crack. These are the most evil, disrespectful creature in the universe, and their mission is to destroy the earth. And this got me thinking, do we need the Vogans to do this? I mean, let's be honest, 129 million hectares of forest destroyed since 1990. That's 30 times the surface area of Switzerland. 17% of the Amazon rainforest gone since 1970. 5 million tons of plastics we just spew into the sea every year. We only know 14% of the world's living organisms, but 20,000 of those are on the endangered list. This is World Overshoot Day. Every day we can celebrate when the world's inability to absorb the inorganic carbon from the atmosphere into organic carbon is exceeded. In 1971, we had a crossover point. One planet, usage for sequestration of carbon. It is now the 8th of August in 2016. We need 1.6 planets to sequester ad adequate carbon, and we need to act and we need to do something. So should we panic? Is don't panic applicable in this situation? That friendly message on the guide? Say don't panic yet. But I'm not sure how optimistic we should be. But there are reasons for optimism because I think there's some companies that know where their towels are. <laughs> I think Bula is such a company. In fact, it's not a company that knows where its towels are. We insist that our employees know where their towels are. Not 125 years, it's 157 years ago that Adolf Bühler learned how to cast steel rolls that replaced all the stones in flour mills, that built the world's biggest milling company in terms of technology supply, that provides safe food all across the world. But not only food, safe, nutritious, healthy food, also e-mobility and new technologies in e-mobility. So since the inception of this company, innovation has been absolutely key to drive the growth of the company. And this little company from Utsville, this little family company and still family company, 100% owned by one family, takes its responsibility for the world very, very, very seriously. And last summer, we convened 750 people, now, those 750 people that came to Utsville of all places, can you imagine? Between them, they fed 4 billion people a day. 4 billion people a day. And they came to us to discuss how to reduce energy consumption globally. How to improve food safety, how to deliver adequate and affordable nutrition. And how do you use the digital revolution to do this more efficiently and better than ever before? That's not bad for a little company from Utsville. And what we did was we said, do you understand the cost of feeding the world today in terms of energy? Do you understand that a quarter of the world's greenhouse gases come from agriculture? 70% of the world's water use is in agriculture. One third of the world's global energy is used for food production. But one third of food is lost or wasted. So that means 10% of the world's energy is specifically targeted at creating waste. That means 23% of the world's water is specifically utilized for creating waste. And 8% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are generated in order to create waste. So we said, shouldn't we do something about this? And we said, look, we want to create sustainable value chains 
for our customers. This is not about switching off the lights in the office. Switching off the lights in the office is about raising awareness. We want our customers operating our lines 24-7, 365 days a year for 20, 30, 40 years to reduce their energy consumption by 30% and reduce their waste by 30%, and we will make technologies available to do that. So that's nice looking forward, but let's look back. This isn't a new story. One billion people eat pasta regularly. The highest energy consumption in pasta manufacturing is drying. We released two years ago technologies that take 40% of the energy consumption out of drying. And you say, that's great, that's nice. So what? Do you know what that means economically for a pasta producer? One percentage point of EBIT. And I tell you today, I don't care why people reduce energy consumption. If it's economic, it's because, if it's because they love trees, I don't care. They must do it. So we give them good economic reasons to do it. Tortillas. Three quarters, of the world's uh, three quarters of a billion people rely on tortillas for their staple diet. We created new processes that reduced the water consumption by 91%. Not to 91%, reduction of 91%. 27% less energy to feed 750 million people. That's a good step. Pulse milling. Pulses, the staple food of India and the surrounding countries. We've just developed technologies to take 40% of the energy consumption out of producing these. This is game-changing on a massive, scalable level. And if we look forward, the opportunity of Internet of Things, I mean, this is the technology evolution that will change more things in my lifetime than anything else I'm ever going to see. This is an extraordinary opportunity to reduce energy consumption, to ensure uptime of lines, to bring transparency to what is happening across value chains around the world. The, the problem and the barrier is not technology. The problem is human. Because the human interfaces where we have protected what we do are going to break down because collaboration is key to actually optimize value chains as a system, not as a single node. And to do the systems analysis, the Internet of Things is going to give us the data transparency. And that will change the game. You know that if in 2050 we have 9 billion people, we need to supply 265 million tons more protein to the world. We're working very hard on how we do that. We believe insects will be key for that, for animal feed going forward. And very soon we expect to be the leader in this field. Waste reduction. Did you know? Did you know that Bula? is the only company in the world that has a continuous lithium-ion battery slurry production working in industry making batteries. So what? Batteries have a 30% scrap rate because of dif differences and deviations batch to batch of slurry production. You make a slurry, you do all the battery production, you test the battery, and at the end of the day, what happens? You find out if it works. Think of how much energy and money you've invested in that. If you can reduce the scrap rate by having well-controlled continuous processing, and we take our knowledge from food to deliver this, you make e-mobility e a reality because you lower the cost of the energy required. But this sounds great, but this isn't the work of one company. This is not the old model of inventing inside and then going out and colonizing the world with your brilliant technology. This is the age of collaboration. In order to move this faster and to hit the accelerating timelines that we have to deliver in the digital world, the rate of exponential change is too high. You have to collaborate. So we fundamentally change the way we innovate. And we innovate with our suppliers. It's nice to be on the stage with ABP. We innovate with our suppliers, we present with our suppliers. We innovate with our customers around the world. We leverage the global academic networks. You say, so what? Everybody does this. We founded the World Food System Center in ETH Zurich. We founded the Integrated Nutrition and Food Center in EPFL. We founded the Business Model Innovation Think Tank with Sangalan. 
We work with universities everywhere. This type of integration is very important because you have to build an ecosystem if you, who works together and collaborates within the country and across the world if you're going to tackle these major issues. But on top of that, you have to keep, create a culture of entrepreneurship because without that, all this nice technology is worth zero because it has to be commercialized and you need the entrepreneurs to do that. So two things we did to create a culture of entrepreneurship, which I think are very interesting. One is inside our company, every two years, we challenge the entire workforce to come up with ideas. Now we have 11,000 people across the world, 3,600 people actively engage in this program every two years. It's totally inclusive. It allows them to create businesses. The ideas that come through, they get fully empowered to create their businesses. We had a little party before Christmas because one of our internal startups created a million of additional turnover in one year in an area that we didn't work previously and that will now become key to our company. But what happens in these companies is you get great ideas and great people and they're highly motivated and then you put them back into an old R&D system. It's like running like hell and getting stuck in treacle and they stop moving. So with some of our friends, with Nestle, with Givaudan, with Barry Calabo, with GEA, with the Swiss Economic Forum, the Inartis Foundation, we brought Mass Challenge, one of the most successive, successful startup accelerators in the world. We brought them and enabled them to found in Switzerland last year. We accelerated 70 startups, they did, we helped them. They attracted 13 million of VC investment. They hired 47 people in the startups. They received prizes. They got 20 contracts and four new companies founded in Switzerland to drive employment and economic growth in Switzerland. But we put some of our internal guys through so they had the full entrepreneurial experience. And I think this culture is tremendously important to have a culture of experimentation as we move forward and we try and solve these massive issues. So if you ask me what the ultimate question is, life, the universe, and everything is, it's can we imagine and can we create a sustainable planet with 9 billion people on in 2050? Because we're doing a very bad job with the number of people we have on the planet today. And I would say yes. Optimistically, we can do this. But things will have to change. We need the new technologies and the brilliant new technologies. We must, we must harness the new business models. Which has, we have to change our way of thinking. We have to change the way we collaborate in terms of business models across the value chain. We must have global entrepreneurs and we must empower them and allow them to experiment and take risk. And we must change the models of collaboration because only massive collaboration is going to allow us to face the challenges of today and of tomorrow. So don't panic. We can be highly optimistic. But do act. Thank you very much.